Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good evening. All right. Um, good evening. My name is Sheena Collier, and I am founder and CEO of Boston Wild Black. Welcome to Black Boston Reimagined Our Own Spaces. Uh, Boston Wild Black, for those who are new to us tonight, is a membership network for Black professionals, entrepreneurs, students, um, really anyone who's seeking connection and community. Our mission is to create a city where Black people want to live, work, and play because they have the spaces, the tools, and the relationships uh, to, to navigate the city, find their tribe, grow their network, navigate the city, and have fun. We host monthly social events, co-working days, town halls, and expert panels for our 300 plus members. But our hope is really to have an impact on Black people that is felt citywide, regionally, and even nationally. Our community is powered by my own experience of moving here 15 plus years ago. Um, I moved up here from, I'm from New York, moved up here from Georgia to attend Harvard and had a, a hard time navigating Boston, particularly as a black woman. Uh, we're also informed by the many stories that we've heard from black people, both transplants and native Bostonians who still don't feel a sense of belonging in Boston. We started this Black Boston Reimagine public conversation series last year with the question, what makes a city the best place for black people to thrive? And how can we create that in Boston? And we know that these aren't new questions or conversations, uh, but we do wanna create a space for new solutions. Some of those will lead on, some will be following others who are already working on these changes. And so tonight is our third conversation in that series uh, focused on how can we center Black culture, Black experiences, Black joy, and Black ownership in the physical spaces across Boston's neighborhood. Given how this week has gone so far, it's a timely conversation. Um, it's always timely, but um, in particular, talking about the spaces where we can feel safe. The unfortunate um, murder and harassment of Dante Wright and Lieutenant Navarro have brought up for us again, this conversation about where can black people um, feel like we have the right to just be, you know, and, and where are the spaces where we um, know that we're safe and, and frankly can stay alive. And so while we are mourning and experiencing yet another trauma together, I do hope that we can also continue to reimagine and, and uh, speak life and envision and and think about the future and not in a fairy tale way that doesn't acknowledge the realities of the world that we live in, but more so in a way where we understand that future generations actually need us to keep reimagining and pushing for something different. For tonight in particular, it was important to us to have a cross section of voices. Not every single voice is represented, but we were intentional about bringing together policymakers, developers, culture creators, uh, curators, and business owners to discuss the role that physical space plays in creating community, creating culture, and commerce. And though uh, those groups that I just mentioned may feel they're on different sides at times, it's really gonna take all of us to design the local policies, the inclusive planning processes, and the access to capital money that we need to take up more of the existing spaces in Boston and create our own. Uh, we know how important it is to have um, safe spaces where we can celebrate the multitudes of our existence that aren't dictated by those outside of the black community. So why don't we have more of them? Uh, as I'm, I'm about to bring our um, folks on stage, drop in the chat some of your favorite venues, restaurants, events, past and present um, that you consider part of Black Boston. You know, we know how important past and present places like Wally's, Blue Wave, um, the Caribbean Festival, Nubian Notion, the Collaborative Cookout, Black Market, Chez Vu, uh, Nubian Gallery, 
Bob the Chef's, then Daryl's, Stepping Out, um, Soleil Restaurant, and, and many, many more. Um, we know how important these places, these events are to us seeing ourselves and to seeing each other. I, I once read this quote that I take with me everywhere. Uh, it was by this, um, I was reading something about Black co-working spaces. A couple of years ago, there was this rise of Black people creating co-working spaces. And this professor at Columbia, Black guy said that, um, Justin Moore, safe and equitable spaces, particularly for Black people, is as economic as it is social. So yes, we are communal people who like to have fun, but this is also about our livelihoods. Uh, I hope you get something from tonight's conversation, particularly what actions you can take, whether it's you personally doing something or holding accountable the people who should be. Uh, we will have time for Q&A, so please share questions as they come up uh, for, for folks who might be um, newer just to distinguish the type of Zoom we're using tonight is the webinar feature. So there's the chat where I see people are dropping in the chat, but separately there's a QA and a um, button at the bottom of your screen. So when you have actual questions that you'd like me to ask the panelists, drop them in there. We'll try to address them um, as we get to that section. And just so you know the flow of the conversation, you know, we, we will start with discussing barriers, but we will move to reimagining what the future can be. And that's really important for us at Boston Wild Black is to be future uh, forward thinking. Um, and even in the midst of dark times, continuing to create joy and, and think about you know, the, the future we wanna see. So um, thank you again for being here. I'm gonna bring up our panelists. Um, they all have amazing extensive bios. So I'm gonna read a part of them, because um, I know they'll be talking about what they do, but I just want to give you a sense of who they are. Um, sorry. So, and I'm trying to follow you. Um, so first, I want to introduce Kirk Sykes. He's the Managing Director of Accordia Partners LLC, which is a Boston-based real estate investment and development company. Accordia executes large scale public private real estate projects with a goal of financial and socially responsible investing success. Previously, Mr. Sykes was the head of an urban, urban investment development and redevelopment commercial real estate equity fund called Urban Strategy America Fund LP. And it was a true triple bottom line fund, meaning they focused on investment returns, so making money, uh, economic development, as well as environmental sustainability. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Mr. Sykes. Next, I'll bring up Derek Foster Tony. Uh, born and raised in Boston, Derek has had the privilege to grow and connect with his community in ways not often seen in Black-owned spaces. Um, his love for skating drives his passion to sustain the culture and innovate what it could become. Uh, he's the manager of Shea Wu Skating Rink, um, a space I'm sure we're all familiar with. And managing his family-owned skating rink with his siblings has brought meaning and purpose to his life. His mission is to continue expanding their brand and developing his role in the business. Next, I'll bring up Catherine Morris, who's the founder and executive director of Boston Art and Music Soul, our BAMS Fest. Catherine is a mother, an entrepreneur, a visionary, and a visionary who works at the intersection of arts, culture, and creative placekeeping. Over the last 20 years, Catherine has spent her time and energy producing shows, as well as mobilizing and engaging local audiences to experience the arts. As the founder and executive director of BAMS Fest, a volunteer-run nonprofit organization, focus on breaking down racial and social barriers to arts, music, and culture for communities and artists of color across greater Boston and beyond. As a result, BAMS Fest has employed, supported, and presented over 400 local artists, creative entrepreneurs, activated over 25 public spaces, and has attracted over 10,000 attendees. Next, bring up Jacob 
Jacob, I apologize. I didn't even ask you how to pronounce your last name correctly. So I'm going to say it, but then I want you to, to say your name when you came up. Um, Jacob de Bocourt. Um, he's a director of public policy in, off, at, in the office of Councilor Julia Mejia. Um, he was raised in New Jersey and moved to Boston to study political science at UMass Boston, where he would go on to eventually meet then candidate Julia Mejia. In his role, his primary function is to make policy and government operations more understandable, keeping in mind the fact that a city like Boston is resource rich, but often coordination poor. In addition, the policy team has worked to flip the script when it comes to community engagement by creating pathways for people to dictate their own policies on topics, ranging from police reform to economic empowerment to language access. And last but not least, is the honorable, honorable Julia Mejia, Boston City Councilor at large. After a historic recount, she won her seat by a single vote and is now the first Afro-Latina to sit on the Boston City Council. Councilor Mejia is currently the chair of the Committee on Civil Rights and the Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development. She is focused on influencing and inspiring constituents to be actively engaged in all areas of decision-making processes. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, we had an, an amazing conversation leading up to tonight and I'm looking forward to others being able to witness um, the ways that you all I know are committed to, to working together. Um, so I'm gonna actually kick it off with Councillor Mejia. And um, as I mentioned, you know, we'll talk a little bit about barriers um, in, a, in the first um, question, if you all just wanna you know, further introduce yourself as well. Um, but Councilor Mejia, one of the largest barriers to access and physical spaces in the city are structural barriers, so, some of which are policy oriented and some we know which are ingrained in Boston culture. So from your role as Boston City Councilor, what are the barriers you've identified and what changes are you advocating for through legislative policy and programs? Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. We almost are like 140, almost 150 people in the house. So nobody can pack a Zoom like uh, Sheena could. So really excited to be here with you all this evening. Um, I think some of the barriers that we identified happened even before we got into office. Um, we, uh, in our campaign office, we actually opened up our doors to local artists. Um, Ashley Rose was one of the first artists that performed in our campaign office um, doing poetry. Then we invited Ayana Mack to showcase her artwork on our walls. And through that process, we realized that our artist community was hungry for spaces where they can be able to showcase. And so with that, um, with that in mind, uh, we continue to realize as we drove through the city of Boston, so many um, depressed neighborhoods with empty storefronts and realized that there were a lot of small businesses um, who could be incubating in those spaces. And so one of the things that we've been hearing a lot is access to capital, um, access to information, um, it, it, especially for those who are navigating um, the commercial space uh, area we've heard from a lot of our constituents that they can't afford to um, live alone, let alone live in Boston, but do business in Boston because the rents are just extremely too high. Um, and so we can get into a little bit of some of the things that we've done on the, leg on the legislative front, but I think that's gonna be a question that you ask me. Um, I could just tell you that we introduced a hearing order around commercial vacancies and creating opportunities um, for us to identify all of the different commercial lots, vacant lots that we have throughout the city of Boston and figuring out once we know and have a better understanding of the data, figuring out how we can um, tackle that issue and literally open up the doors to our entrepreneurs so that they can incubate in some of these spaces. Um, and then briefly, I can just tell you, we recently passed uh, the residential kitchen ordinance. Um, and this is an opportunity to look for those folks who bake, um, whether you make teas or, um, or baked good bagels, um, dry foods, things that don't 
um, require a special room temperature, uh, the residential kitchen ordinance is um, set up. We hope we'll close the, uh, the wealth gap and create opportunities for people to literally um, make dough, <laughs> literally, from their own homes and be able to uh, sell their goods. Um, at farmers markets, online, and other spaces. So we hope that that contribution, that law was just passed a few weeks ago and it goes into effect on April the 30th. And we did that in collaboration with constituents, which is the model of our policymaking efforts is people led all day, every day. I love that, thank you. One, one thing I, of many things that I love about the way that Councilor Mejia governs is um, she's about action and finding creative ways. You see, she 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 touched on the barriers, but she was like, "But this is how we're <laughs> we're tackling them." Because I think that um, you know, for those of us, I've been in Boston almost twenty years. Many of you are from Boston. Um, we know that there's lots of barriers here, but um, again, we want to push forward, and um, it, nothing's possible. Um, nothing seems possible until you do it, you know. And I think that she's really modeled. Um, through government, how you can actually move things um, forward faster, I think, than a lot of us think. Um, Catherine, I wanted to bring you in. You know, you created BAMS Fest, which has undoubtedly impacted the cultural vitality of Boston. Um, as I mentioned, over the past two years, over 10,000 people have attended, over 14, uh, 400 people of color artists who've been hired, promoted, or supported. Uh, what was um, missing from the Black cultural scene in Boston that you thought BAMS Fest would fill? And how does what Councillor Mejia shared um, about barriers and solutions resonate with your experience? Thank you for having me. Um, this is a, a phenomenal panel. I'm seeing all the comments. Um, for me, you know, being a Native, all my family's here. Um, I, I recognize that there has been a deficit in cultural programming for Black people for damn near over 30 years. And I mean, in a large scale sense. Um, all the cultural events um, that I've grown to know and love that my family has and, and that has been passed on a generation uh, has been so cut down um, because people don't understand our culture and they think it's violent or associate all different types of stereotypes that are not true. It's just how we express ourselves. Um, it might look something to one group, but that's, that's who we are as people of color, as people who embrace joy and, and embrace challenges. We express it differently that may, be a, that may be atypical of other groups. Um, and so for me, what I, in that, I recognize that a lot of uh, Boston-based artists, uh, New England-based artists uh, that identify as Black, that identify as um, uh, biracial, were not being represented, not just in, in genre and discipline, but there were spaces that were just not accepting them uh, because of their artistic platform or because of where they're from. And as a fan first, I don't tolerate that. I don't think that's fair because when you deny an artist and you deny community access to the types of uh, artistry that's available to the type of uh, creativity or imagination um, that brings us all together and helps us to, to work through things and celebrate life. So Bands Fest as an organization is more than a festival or a cultural movement. We're about supporting black and brown artists no matter what and either taking up space and programming in that or creating space on our own, no matter where we are across the city to prove the point um, that we're needed, we're valued, uh, and that what we do makes the city and state uh, more attractive, more appealing, but it retains the people here because they have something uh, for to look to every single day. Um, uh, with regard to, to um, uh, Ms. Mejia, I will say that, you know, what resonates for me in terms of barriers, when I started this, um, I was, uh, when, I, when I pitched the idea to the city to do this festival, I was laughed at and told me it would never happen. And that was in 2014. And I looked at those individuals and I said, I'll come back in 2018, you watch. And we debuted June 2018. Um, because I refused for someone to tell me that my culture is not worth it. It's not enough when everyone else profits off of it. So, you know, through our sit, through our festival, we've been able to break barriers in terms of artists being given a visibility, them being able to be um, hired correctly and being paid um, at their worth, but also activating spaces um, and taking up space in, in places that typically would have never welcomed us given our city's history. Uh, but those barriers still remain real as one of a handful of black women who are producing festivals in the city. 
let alone the state. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, I want to bring in Derek, you know, um, Catherine among, with BAMS Fest in particular, um, she does, uh, you know, other work around the city as well, but is brought in, bringing up this conversation of like outdoor space, you know, because even when I initially conceptualized this, I really meant like indoor spaces that we can get access to and um, had a conversation with Catherine and she was like, yo, outdoor space as well. Like you assume that outdoor space is open to everyone. Um, but there's a lot of spoken and unspoken things that let us know that we're not welcome in outdoor spaces as well. Um, but for, for Derek, who's running a, a indoor space, Shave Wu, um, which has been um, operating since 1933, your family's been operating it for a number of years. You can share with us how long. You know, last year when COVID-19 began spreading um, around the world, country, Massachusetts, and non-essential businesses were forced to close, Shevu pivoted from one form of culture building, roller skating, to another, food. Talk us through how you made the transition and what updates you needed to make to stay viable. You are on mute. Here we go. Sorry about that, you guys. Okay, uh, so the things we had to do to pivot uh, from a roller skating rink to a restaurant was pretty easy because um, we were known for our great food and, uh, and, the, and the quality of our food. Um, if you ask anybody, they come to Shebu for our chicken, um, our fresh fried foods, and we stand out in that regard when it comes to us versus other roller skating rinks because our food has always been you know, of that quality. We always did Sunday dinners and always kept it fresh for our community. So, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic pretty much hit us very, very hard. Um, roller skating rinks are not the kind of space that generates the kind of income that can survive that kind of economic loss for long periods of time, which is why you see a lot of places closing down like us, uh, a lot of rinks have closed. But what makes us different is, become, is that we have the access to the community, we're right in the heart of the community and uh, the community trusts us. So once we had made that pivot and we started doing uh, our dinners on Sundays, it became very popular. So we said, okay, uh, well, this is gonna be something we have to hold on to because we were the only roller skating rink in Massachusetts that was unable to, to open the entire stretch of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because at one point, at least the other, um, the other cities like Saugus and um, Taunton were able to at least open under their own different jurisdictions. Uh, and it actually worked for us. Uh, the community responded. Uh, we still do it to this day because we're still, um, undergoing some renovations to open to the public safely. So we're still keeping the food going. But um, it, it was just a remarkable uh, and quick change for us. And it, it, was, it, was, it was a no brainer because if it wasn't that, it would have been very difficult for us to stay afloat for, the, uh, for over a year now. Yeah, wow. And we'll, we'll get more into later about um, what the future is going to look like. And, and even, I know even besides, along with food, you all did do some outside stuff this summer. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. I want to burst out laughing because I'm looking at the chat and people are, like, <laughs> clearly nobody knows French because they were like, they didn't know it was Shebu. It was Shebu's. Um, <laughs> yeah, Shebu, <Shea> yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to get that out. Um, so um, I want to bring Kirk into the conversation. So as I mentioned, when I introduced um, Kirk is a developer and, you know, part of, I spent a big part of my career working at Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, um, focusing on um, land and access among many other things. And, uh, you know, oftentimes you see uh, contention between the community and developers. You know, when we really think about what's happening in the city, um, we're, we're often pointing the fingers at each other. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that, you know, as a developer, as a black owned company, as a, um, you know, creating space in black neighborhoods that we have Kirk in the conversation. So many people don't realize the lengthy timelines that development projects have, including the kind of ramp period before the shovel hits the ground where many decisions are made. And, I've had this conversation with lots of people that oftentimes by the time we see something, it's, it's kind of too late for us to get engaged. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, conversations have happened for years before we even actually physically see anything. So Kirk, where does stakeholder involvement fit into a standard real estate project? And then tell us about the project you're currently spearheading uh, through Dorchester Bay City 
and how your team has thought about how residents can be active stakeholders early on in the process before it's too late to influence change. And I'm sorry, I'm asking you like four questions at once. I'll, I'll repeat if I need to. And then what vehicles are available for Black people in particular to invest and operate in that space? Yeah, no, thank you very much. And, and what a great forum you guys have created here. You know, I thank you for letting me be the resident OG here, at, you know, with 40 years in. Um, so, you know, it, it's just great to hear about how we don't segregate our passions. You know, our DNA is about pivoting, about infusing, you know, kind of the vibrancy of Black culture into the places we make, the things we do, and, and pivoting. I mean, I hear the Shea Vu story, and, you know, it, we always serve food where we had fun. You know, I mean, that was, that's just the nature of the place, whether it was Satch's, you know, back in the day with Satch Sanders playing for the Celtics and running a chicken joint down in Columbus uh, Avenue, or, you know, uh, Paul's Mall, where we played jazz down now where Emerson is, you know, I mean, we were all over the city doing what we do, and we should be. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to make that place anew at Dorchester Bay City. But your question uh, is a simple answer. You know, when, when's the right time to get involved? The answer is, uh, it's never too early. You know what I mean? And, and it, it is, when it's too late, it creates a problem because people kind of go to their corner. You know, you, you, you're defending your position, I'm defending my position. Now we never find the happy middle ground. And so uh, we're very excited that with you know, this project that we began three years ago, actually, um, we, we are still a year and a half away from putting a shovel in the ground. So that should tell you both a little bit about the scale, but also about how much time it takes to make a major project. And that's time to get people engaged. And so to talk a little bit about that engagement, um, before we ever had a public process uh, going back uh, two years ago, uh, we had some community visioning sessions with a couple hundred people uh, in each one. And they were led by a facilitator that we provided, but they brought in people to hear their visions. We, we took post-its and everybody put their idea of what this place should be on a post-it. And then we stuck them on a board, you know, 200 post-its. I'll someday have to show you the picture. It, it's quite amazing. It looks a lot like what we ended up with. You know, it talked about open space. It talked about places to play music. It talked about places where everyone could go. It talked about open space in terms of greenery where there's now asphalt, you know. So, um, you know, we are st we still have a long way to go. We, we went through uh, three months and six meetings on Zoom last fall, which involved hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, but it's never too late. And um, so I, I guess what I'd encourage everybody to do is both get involved in our project, but in go get involved in all city projects, you know, and get involved early. Don't wait for somebody to ask you, go see the sponsor and say you want a voice. Uh, there are some forums for that. Uh, you know, I sit on what's called the Boston Civic Design Commission. Uh, that commission is intended to talk about how major projects uh, over 100,000 square feet affect the public. They're about art. They're about open space. They're about shadows. They're about lights. They're about safety. It's about who feels comfortable there. It's about preventing things from happening that you don't want to happen, you know, and how do we do that with lighting and sight lines and things. But those are open to the public. Every Tuesday, every one of you can go and be part of that conversation. And so, you know, we kind of owe it to ourselves to develop our, our skill set for engaging people in, in projects. You know, if, if we don't have a voice and uh, we don't spend the time to kind of facilitate our voice, somebody's going to give us a voice. You know, and I like to say somebody will pimp you, you know, they will tell you what is good for you, you know, and we don't want that, you know, you want to speak for you, your community wants to speak for you. And that that takes an investment of time and energy and people should engage you, but if they don't engage you, you got to go engage them. So let me stop there. Yeah, I, I want to speak to a couple of things that you said and, um, and um, I'm going to bring in Jacob too to, to talk about, um, and I'm sure Councillor Mejia, probably everyone here has thoughts around that, because I know that 
though public, um, it's like, like many things kind of like hidden in plain sight, <laughs> a lot of this information, you know, and you have to be a little bit in the know. So I actually wanted to share one, something that I personally do. So um, Martina and my team just dropped the link to the Boston Civic Design Commission actually talked about, but the main site that that's on bostonplans.org are the Boston Planning and Development Agency. I actually signed up for alerts for all the neighborhoods that I want to know what's going on. And I get an email anytime there's an announcement of a new project. Now this is like, I'm a nerd about this and I really love doing it. So um, I'm not saying this is the only solution because I actually don't think people have, should have to become development experts to, to be involved in our communities. But I personally uh, sign up. I see when meetings are, there are often at times people are at work brief pandemic. Um, so there are these ways, and I think that we have to continue to open these, uh, open it up even further for more people to be involved, but there's definitely ways. I read the Bay State banner. Um, I find out a lot in the banner that I don't find out in other um, news outlets um, about what's going on around the city. Um, so those for me are two really important resources. Um, I wanna ask Kurt before I move on from you and we'll come back to this um, accessibility piece too, but you know, we talked about specifically vehicles, you know, we, we're talking about ownership and access, but people also can invest in spaces as well, you know, and operate their businesses spaces. Can you talk about your vision around um, people being able to invest in, you know, later operate in the space? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, so let, let me start with um, most of wealth creation in America came out of real estate. And when we talk about that $8 versus $247,000 difference between uh, black and brown net worth and white net worth, uh, we're talking about real estate. And it, it, unfortunately, we haven't participated because of the GI Bill, because of redlining, because of predatory lending. Those have all been impediments to black people participating in building their wealth. And so it's been a cornerstone of the projects that we do that we always pursue uh, basically folks that look like us, black and brown folks who can be investors in our project. That said, um, that space is getting better, more accessible. You know, the, uh, the federal government uh, through the SEC, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission determines that they wanna protect you by only letting people with a lot of money, no matter what color they are, invest in projects. So uh, historically qualified investors are people who make more than a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and have a million dollars in net worth to invest. And, and there are rules that say that's who you can engage. There is a way around that uh, called Reg D, you know, kind of, um, there's a platform first called Cadre, which lets people invest as little as $50,000, still a lot of money. And they basically act as an intermediary. But the thing I think I'm most excited about is something called uh, crowdfunding. So crowdfunding uh, is a way for people to invest down to $1,000 in real estate. And there's a website you can check out called Small Change. It's pretty interesting. There's a brother who, a uh, good cat in Baltimore, who just funded uh, part of a $6 million project with 130 investors putting in uh, $335,000. And uh, it's called... Um, Woodridge Plaza, I believe. Uh, so small change basically will take small increments of capital, let you put it into a community-based or a, a commercial development. And the increment is one we can all begin to think about, $1,000 to $5,000. And the multiple that they project is between three and four times of what you put in. So if you had the luxury of parking $1,000 for five seven, eight, 10 years, you could get back four to $5,000. Now, obviously that's, that's not grits and groceries money. That's money that you can afford to basically get a return on. And everybody knows about a diversified portfolio. You know, you, you need a bank account and you need a way to retire. You're not gonna retire on your bank account return with zero interest, but you might retire if you put a little bit of your money into a small change kind of platform. So let me stop there. We get into like a wealth building class. I love it. I'm sorry. I got to oh. do that. <laughs> no, I love it. 
And um, we will, because um, I know a lot is being dropped in the chat from us and from others, and we'll make sure to try to pull together some of this information when we send folks a um, follow-up email. Um, Jacob D. So um, welcome. Please uh, correct me if I, I said your name wrong when you come up. But um, society and, and many of us are generally cynical of politics and its ability to affect real change, particularly in the Black community where issues like voter, vo voter suppression, um, which we're talking about again right now, continue to limit our voices in the political process. How do you see the real life impacts of legislation aiding greater accessibility for Black and Brown communities, creating more entrepreneurs and generational wealth? And what other cultural shifts need to happen in order for physical spaces to be more accessible to these communities? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, and thank you, Sheena. It's uh, Jacob de Blaycourt. Uh, it's not easy on first, second, or 54th view, so I don't, I don't blame you. Um, but your point about society being cynical of politics is spot on. And, and frankly, I think society has every right to be cynical of politics. I think when you look around neighborhoods and you see a lot of empty spaces or even RCC spaces that are being occupied by being occupied by people who only want to show up in our neighborhoods to make a profit off of us, I think it's perfectly fair to look around and say, well, what has politics actually done for me? But I want to take a moment to make a distinction between politics and policy because they're two very different things. Policy is the what. It's like what needs to be done in order to fix these problems when it comes to accessibility. Politi politics is the how. How do these things get done? Or in many cases, how do these things not get done? Um, and so I like to think of good policy as doing two very important things. One is that it follows the leadership of the community, or at the very least, it's designed in collaboration with the community. And two, it meets people where they're at. So to Councilor Mejia's point about retail residential kitchens, we found out in October that there were around 22 people in the city of Boston, primarily in Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, and Hyde Park, who are operating um, illegally out of their homes. Well, instead of going into their homes and saying, hey, get out, you got to go into the, the rat race and find a space, we figured, well, why don't we just make it legal for them to operate businesses in their home? So sometimes just telling people to go through the normal processes isn't good enough and we have to find ways to make new spaces. And sometimes that occurs through policy, but like you said, Sheena, sometimes it takes place through cultural shifts. I think a really great example is uh, the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library is closed on Saturdays and Sundays. What does that say, what does that tell to our community about how we're prioritizing public spaces? Is that, well, we don't want you in these spaces. The Copley branch is open on Saturday, but the Roxbury one is closed on Saturday. So we really need to have a conversation about where are these spaces that already exist and how can the city take on cultural changes to actually make them more accessible to people? Thank you, that was so concise, I wasn't even ready. Um, <laughs> I, I'm actually trying to think about how I wanna go from there because I, um, I'll guess given particularly the, the comment you just made on the um, libraries, I wanna bring in Catherine again, you know, because when we, talk about culture and the reason we're here tonight, you know, it's in inclusive of these spaces we have to come together. So I know for me, um, growing up, it was the two annual cookouts that my family hosted at our house um, in our driveway with a DJ and my father on the grill. Um, for a lot of people, it is their backyard, the mall, a church, um, many places like that where our formative memories are held. Um, how do you feel like access to dedicated spaces built for and Black people influences culture? And how does culture influence the spaces that we need to build? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I had to like think about this because it's, it's, a, it's a loaded question. I mean, one can't exist without the other, quite frankly. Um, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about melanated people is that we have... Uh, you know, amazing gifts. We have a magic that no one could ever understand that shapes every society across this world planet. And, you know, we set the trends, we break the trends, we stop the trends like that. It's just, it's part of our swag and our DNA. So to me, the, you know, access to space um, allows for the greatest um, ability to expand our black imagination. Um, our, our, our cultural well-being, our spirituality, you know, what pisses us off, what brings us joy, all those different things and allows us to connect verbally and non-verbally with each other, but also people who come into these spaces. 
but you know, you know, access to these to these spaces allows us to wear our blackness in a wholesome way without ever being questioned about it. And with that comes out of some of the best things, whether it's a new idea or real estate or clothing or running for office, because you don't have to code switch. You don't have to do any of those things because you are in a space where the conversation can be a head nod and that says everything you need to say in the space with your people. So it's very important in terms of access um, and, in, and not just that, the design of that space for us. Um, it looks different than downtown. It looks different than corporate. Um, you know, even, even the difference between a square doorway to our archway communicates something to people of color because we're connected to math and science and design and circles and all those things that feed into our history in a very Afrofuturistic way. All that matters and not just getting there, but how it looks and feels, colors, textures, all those things, bathroom design, seating, like all that affects how we move and shake in these spaces. Black people. I'm listening to you. <laughs> I mean, there's just, yeah, the, I, I won't even repeat what you said because you said it all. Um, Derek, you know, we've seen in pop culture how roller skating rinks have become, have. I think always been because I went skating growing up, but beacons of culture and community for Black people through music, through food, as you mentioned, family celebrations, and really a place that embodies joy. Um, tell us about Shebu's long legacy in both your family and in the Boston community. What, it mean, what did it mean for you to have a space like that from the time you were a child, and how has it become an anchor of support for the community that surrounds it? So my, my family has had a long lineage in Shebu even before we purchased the property to own it. Uh, so we would, you know, my father would um, work in different, different, um, you know, managerial positions. And uh, my grandmother worked long-term within, within the community, my aunt. So um, it, was, it was very special to me to have that space since I was a kid. I mean, that's all I've known was skating. I mean, I could, I've been skating since I literally could walk. Um, to have that development and being, being a part of a community where we knew that we were accepted, we can grow and we can develop together. And a lot of these, and a lot of that had contributed to why now I can do what I do now because I have such a long-term, a lifelong reputation and relationship with so many people in the community, now with their children, now with different organizations and people now taking power and you know, different positions in the city so we can actually continue to make change. And um, Shebu was always just the place where you can come, you can release all of your stress, you can be accepted. There was no, like, like we were just talking about code switch and there was none of that. We accepted you and, you know, in French, Shebu means our home. And that's something that we really drove home and we still do to this day. And a lot of people don't see it as just a place where you go and roller skate and you go and just to pay your admission and go around in circles. This is a place for community. This is a place for familyhood. This is a place to learn, to grow. And there's so many different components that we offer and we've been offering for years that um, you know it's built its own legacy and the community appreciates that because there's not a lot of places still available to people that have that kind of depth, that kind of depth when it comes to those kind of uh, those kind of principles. You know, we're not really accepted in seen as equal in so many different spaces, no matter what we do. Uh, they look at people of color and they think we're chaotic. We think, they think, you know, we're rambunctious. When really, we just want to have a good time and not have to always look over our shoulder and be somebody that we're not. And Shavu was very big on accepting everybody and showing love and making sure that everybody was safe. Everyone that saw it as a safe haven, uh, whether it was a child, an adult, an adult, the families, we had that duty and that responsibility Although it's been very heavy to carry over the years because, you know, there was so much responsibility, you're always going to run into some things. But it, it, uh, it really, really makes a difference, especially for me now in the position I'm in, being much older and, and man managing, I can connect in a different way that a lot of people can't see when it comes to these kind of spaces. Because I, I, I've, I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, I've seen the slow part and the parts that we need to expand upon to grow it to where, you know, in 10 years, 20 years from now, we can still be building on that same legacy that um, people of color and the people of our community have come to know us um, to this day. All right, and I, I hope it'll, I mean, it's been here since the thirties. I hope it <laughs> continues on for another yeah. plus. Um, just want to um, 
uh, just a couple of reminders. Please drop uh, your questions in the Q and A. We're gonna um, start to take those. Um, Keith, we see your, I see your question, and um, encourage others to share questions as well. Um, Councillor Mejia. So as movements collide, there is a significant amount of conversation about how we define issues in the context that that definition, definition carries. Um, since I've been, um, you know, Boston Wild Black, we launched last year and have been having a lot of conversation about space among many other things. But in this work, I learned about this field of study called spatial justice. And the, um, the idea behind it is that justice has a geography and the equitable distribution of resources, services, and access is a basic human right. Would you say access to space is a civil rights issue and how would we address it differently if we viewed it as such? Absolutely. So first, I just want to let you know that I also went to Shabu's when I was a kid, and now my daughter goes there, just so you know. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And I'm so happy to see that you all are still in that space, owning it, literally. Um, but that's not the question. So I, so I, I, I want to bring into this conversation, Sheena, that I think it's important for us to also note that our office filed a hearing order um, to ensure that black and brown businesses have presence all across the city of Boston. We should not just be regulated to Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan. Um, we need to be in Newberry Street. We need to be in the Seaport. We need to be in the North End. We need to be all up in the Faneuil Hall area too, right? So when I think about justice and I think about civil rights and I think about how we have been redlined to certain spaces just to live, that is also how we have been, um, been unable to thrive and, and build wealth because the spaces where you tend to occupy, um, they might have high traffic food, uh, food um, access, but we know in downtown, we know in Faneuil Hall, we know in the Boston Common, that's where all the tourists are and that's where all the money is, right? So we need to make sure that we're thinking um, intentionally about what spatial justice looks like. And so our hearing order, we have a hearing on April the 22nd, I believe it is, um, to talk about this issue, issue in particular and what does that look like when we're really intentional about um, building that movement, right? So that we're not dysregulated to certain spaces. And I think it's also important to note that there are other structural things in place and that there are other organizations doing a lot of work around space, not just in the housing, but also in the commercial space and just kind of like how we do business in general in the city of Boston. Um, one of the other hearings that we're filing is around impact advisory groups. There are a lot of people who occupy space in those spaces that have nothing to do with the neighborhoods that they're there to speak up on, on behalf of, right? So our hearing order is to ensure that if you're gonna occupy space in these impact advisory groups that you are there and you are actually a real stakeholder. And to Kat's point, like if you have people who are living the realities, in informing what the planning is going to look like, then we'll have the um, architectural design that is reflective of our culture, right? Um, oftentimes, you know, what we see is people come in and they show us something to react to. And, and, and I think that that doesn't feel justice to me, right? That doesn't, it feels like they're doing things for us without us. And I think that when we think about movement building, we have to look at all of the barriers that are also I'm created. And I know, Kurt, I make a joke, and this is the thing that I remember my first few weeks in, on, in the council, I went to some advisory group that I think you're a part of, and they only had food for y'all. And I was hungry. It was like six o'clock. I'm like, wait, I can't, I'm a counselor. Y'all not going to let me get a sandwich? And so if we're serious about creating space for people to be involved, then we need to remove barriers. And we know there are people who are working nine to five. And they don't have time to go home and cook dinner. They might be on a budget if you're an entrepreneur, particularly. Like we need to really think about like how are we building movements and being super intentional about the people who normally don't participate in these conversations. And I think all of that, Sheena has to be a part of the dialogue in terms of movement building. But I think that the word movement has become such a cliche and we've gotten away from the core principles of what, what it really is to build a movement. It's really about building the capacity of the people, um, not coming in with your agenda and then asking them to um, follow it. It's really about building the agenda with the people and providing the, the container for people to do for themselves and then keep it moving. 
market. That's what real movement building needs to look like in the yeah. city of Boston. And you can't build without the people. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. I went on a rampage up in here. I mean, I, I, I receive all of it. Um, I wanna, um, you know, going back to thinking about um, something you said <laughs> that, that made me think of this, but it also, I wanted to pose it directly to, to Jacob um, because of talking about um, access. So you talked about, you know, the resource rich coordination for, um, I also wanna add in, you know, we can't have this conversation about black people and access to space without acknowledging in the backdrop or the forefront um, that we just um, have our first woman and first black mayor in the city and um, shattering this, this glass ceiling that's been in place for almost 199 years. Um, and so, you know, in this conversation about access and, um, you know, the, the many words that are used, diversity, inclusion, and et cetera, there's often a notion that um, white people, white men in particular, lose when women and people of color advance. So what do you think that, um, you know, Kim Janey becoming Mayor Janey means for, you know, having someone in the chief leadership role in the city um, around advancing access for women and people of color business owners who are looking for cultural spaces? Well, that was to Jacob. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I mean, full disclosure for people listening and we did get these questions a little bit in advance. So I've had time to think about it. Um, and truthfully, like, I think a lot of, uh, for a lot of white people, particularly white men, there's this notion that progress is a zero sum game so that in order for someone else to succeed, I have to lose. And obviously we know that's not real, but where does that kind of stuff come from? Uh, I truthfully think a lot of white people, particularly white men are scared that a black woman in power is going to do to them what white men in power have been doing to black women for the past 400 years. Um, yeah, but of course, we also know that that's not true. And, and Sheena, you talked about a glass ceiling. I think it's a, a concrete ceiling, ceiling reinforced with 12 gauge steel and, and whatever else Kirk uses to build his buildings because that's a huge accomplishment. But at the same time, we can't view our electives as only skin deep. And just because we have a black woman in power doesn't mean that the work of advancing access for women and people of color is finished. Uh, I was in fifth grade when Obama was inaugurated. And I remember all of the, the well-meaning white folk in my neighborhood just sort of like dusting their hands off saying, all right, we fixed it, we fixed racism. And if, like, it's, it's BS, I know we're being recorded, so I won't curse, but it's like, it's completely fake. Uh, and so the same kind of thing goes for Boston and we need to push just as hard, if not harder, to open up these spaces for people of color and for women, even, even and, and putting that pressure on our elected officials as well. Um, because the fight is not over just because we have someone different um, in the Eagle Room. Well, thank you. Uh, so I, what, we have a couple questions in the chat that I want to um, bring folks in. They're not addressed to anyone in particular. So I'm gonna ask them and then, um, you know, it may make sense <laughs> for particular folks as I, as I ask them. Um, one question, the first question um, is around inclusion um, in, a, in another way around the disability community. So uh, the question is how will the disability, disability community be included and involved um, in conversations about access to space that um, disability is all, always left out of these conversations um, and events that take place. I don't know if anyone in particular wants to um, address that. I'm you okay? Go ahead, Jacob. I see you with your hand up. I'm gonna let you speak. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one thing I just wanted to say about the word inclusion like, inclusion means that we put up with people and that we tolerate people. Like, we shouldn't be viewing everyone as just like obstacles to the work. They need to be centered in everything that we do. And that includes people with disabilities. I think, like, back before the pandemic, when you would have to go to a hearing at City Hall, I mean, imagine walking across the City Hall Plaza to get into City Hall, uh, or, or, if, or if you need you know, any sort of accessibility. It's not, it can't happen. We're physically designing spaces that are not meant to bring people in, even if those spaces are designed to bring people in. So when we talk about inclusion, it needs to not just be like, well, how can we 
bring people to the table. No, how can we as a government go to their table and meet them where they're at so we can have these kinds of conversations because we co-op spaces when we bring Yes. So you y'all yeah, can see why we hired Jacob, right? And why he's the chief of my policy um, and all things that deal with uh, justice. Uh, so yes, I just wanted to quickly add in terms of that whole inclusion. Um, and I, I'll say this again about the word inclusion, which is what I said about movement. All of these things are beginning to lose their, um, their meaning because everybody's all about these buzzwords these days. And I just think we need to move beyond all the jargon and get real about what it is that we're really trying to do. And while I do appreciate, Sheena, you bringing it in within the lens that people are talking about, I do think that we are, um, people are repackaging and, and then selling it to us as though they just discovered it. We've been trying to be at the table for far too long. Um, but I think it's important for us to really think about this uh, conversation and also be super mindful that while we all here have the privilege of knowing how to read and write, if we're really serious about in, in, including all people, then we also have to be super mindful that not every business owner knows how to read and write even in their own native language. There are a lot of um, immigrants who come to this country who have had uninterrupted education um, that we need to start really thinking about how do we utilize visuals, audio, um, and, and video as a way to engage and 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 um, communicate with people because that also is um, something that could help in terms of including people who have disabilities who may not be able to um, read or write. And I always bring that into every space because I think that we're very privileged up in this room right now in the Zoom. And I think that there are a lot of entrepreneurs while this is the main audience, there are still a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, when, you think of, when you think about the prison to pipeline, there are folks who, who can't read and write because they're reading at a third and fourth grade level, but they have, they know how, they're a barber. They know how to cut hair. They, they're an amazing artist. We need to really start thinking about our own privilege if we're really serious about dismantling and creating spaces for all people to feel included in these spaces. Thank you. Did you wanna jump in, Kirk? Yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to add uh, on, on the front of technology being at a, uh, a way of eradicating barriers. It, 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 we are in the moment of smart and connected cities. And if Zoom showed us anything, it's that you can pretty quickly pivot to give people access to almost anything. That same access is accessible by apps and can translate into multiple languages. And we're a world-class city. So we need to not only welcome our own uh, indigenous less included people, but also the world. And, and that's not that hard, you know, it's, it's ones and zeros and it, it happens on a phone. So uh, beyond the physical barriers, we need to think about um, eradicating mental and linguistic barriers that are easily done with technology. Thank you. Um, there's a question here around green space. You know, we started talking about um, outside access as well. Are there any specific programs that any of you all know of to help create more green spaces in our communities, gardening, growing food, beekeeping, et cetera? More easily done, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, um, you know, from my Boston Civic Design Commissioner seat. Uh, when someone comes forward for approvals for a new project, it's, it's an opportunity to talk about that. If, if you're talking about a program uh, that creates that in a, you know, kind of in a vacuum, I think then it's a community centric push to create community gardens, to recapture open space. Um, you know, my first project in the city was, as you mentioned, at the DSNI project where there were absentee landlords basically, you know, occupying lots with nothing. And we recaptured them and turned them into open space and houses. And, so there is always a mechanism that you can find. And in that case, it was a grassroots effort from the community led by the community to build those places. So, uh, you know, if it doesn't exist on the books, create it. I agree with that. We're, we're all about, Boston Wall Black is all about creating the city you wanna live in. You know, and I think that right. um, Boston is a, is a great place for that. Um, it, we, while we often, you know, and I said this at the beginning, can get bogged down in the barriers because there are many um, and there are issues here um, as there are in America. Um, 
I think that there's also lots of opportunity here for, for those of us who are creators and want to um, solve those barriers. There's two questions around, um, they're somewhat related. So um, someone asked, um, there's some people on here who are new or I saw someone else dropped a, a comment that said they're moving here tomorrow. So welcome, glad that you found this conversation and um, hopefully um, get connected to Boston Wild Black as well. Um, but someone had asked, you know, considering I'm gonna, there's two questions I'm gonna bring in and um, then put it out to folks. So considering there's a lot of work that needs to be done as a recent transplant from an area where black culture and entrepreneurship are embraced uh, with more access, why should I consider staying in Boston? And as a follow-up, someone also asked about, um, to the panelists, what do you all think about Boston's new all-inclusive campaign? Um, and so for folks who don't know what that is, um, it's a campaign that was launched, I think last week, um, really trying to start to change the face of Boston and um, expand beyond, you know, what many people, including myself when I came here, um, associate, you know, Cheers, Red Sox, um, South Boston um, was really all I knew about Boston. So anyone want to, to tackle that? So one, someone's asking, you know, why should I consider staying? Um, but then also, you know, what do you all think about efforts, including the all-inclusive campaign um, to really change the, the narrative and story about Boston? So I'm going to be a ball. I'm going to be a ball hog. Um, our our branding company, Proverb, uh, was part of creating that campaign, and I'm so proud of Darren and what he helped put out with Colette. Uh, it was great, and we we just simply wanted to slap a Dorchester Bay City label on it and said, "Okay, we'll just take that and declare victory." Because uh, to segue to your second question, I, I would say the reason I stay in Boston is because we're getting better. Um, you know, that video is what we're creating, you know, on 35 acres on the water, accessed by a train in Dorchester that's 78% diverse. And all that flavor is exactly what is going to be the reason people come. They're not coming for glass and steel and concrete. They're coming for flavor, you know. And so um, that's why you should stay, because you're going to help make it better. Let me stop. <laughs> Anyone else want to tackle that? So, you know, why yeah. do you stay and also just about efforts to change the face of Boston? Yeah, so I grew up in Boston. I'm one of those special cases, but I moved to New York for 10 years for the bulk of my career because I knew I wasn't going to be able to get opportunities here. I had to leave. To, um, and it wasn't until I came back um, after living in New York for 10 years that I realized how segregated Boston was. But during my time in New York, I um, learned that no matter what space I was in, I always felt like I belonged. And it didn't feel that way for me in here when I returned back to Boston. But that's one of the reasons why I think we need to occupy all of these spaces because we belong in every nook and cranny. Every 22 neighborhoods that exist in the city of Boston, we need to occupy space, whether it be through businesses, entrepreneurs, home ownership, um, renters, like we need to just occupy all of Boston. And I think that, that, that is where we're at right now. And I think that that is where um, I think this moment in time uh, is encouraging us, you know, Kat, with all of the work that you're doing in this space. Um, I just think that if we don't seize this moment as people of color to just claim our roots, literally, um, we're gonna miss out. And I think that I, we need to be loud, we need to be more aggressive, and we need to be more intentional about making sure that Hell no, we won't go, period, <laughs> right? Um, sorry, I swore. And the last thing that I'd like to say um, in regards to the all-inclusive um, campaign, I think it definitely is about setting the, the, the tone about what it means to be in Boston today and um, all of the opportunities that exist for us to see ourselves reflected in all of that. So I'm excited about, about the, the, the vision and, and look forward to holding ourselves accountable to, to that work because one thing is to build beautiful videos and, and, and campaigns and the other piece of it is executing them, right? Um, and to Kat's point earlier, it's navigating anything in the city of Boston. It is like trying to crack the Da Vinci code just to get a permit, right? You don't need all that. And I think that we need to do a better job at making things easier for people to navigate. And that's the way we're gonna get there. Love you. I, can I, can I? Okay, thank you. 
Um, I just want to say um, to that question being asked about why you should stay, I'm not going to lie, it's a question I ask as a native, but having lived, having lived in Philly, having lived in, in North Carolina and New York, Boston is, we're a city of champions, right? But, um, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, if, if you got something to prove, there are many ways you can do that both in your job and, and in the spaces that, that you want to occupy or that should be here. Um, and so that, that grit, that, that commitment, that tenacity to fight, this is the battleground to do it. This is that city to do it. You know, and if you're willing to put in the, the energy and resources, that's why you should stay. Because beyond your, your, your job or whatever that you do, there is, a, there is literally opportunities happening now more than ever that I've experienced that um, all of us are going to be reaping the benefits from, but we're stronger in numbers than versus an individual. So if you're, you know, I would say to, to not just that one person, but for everyone that, that may be new to Boston, um, if you want to see more Black culture, it requires Black people. It requires more of us to be present um, and yelling as loud as we can, but also being unapologetic in our actions of taking space because no one's gonna give it to us. And what's even more beautiful is that when we take up space, then people realize all those stereotypes they had can go out the door because we prove them wrong. And as melanated people, that's our magic. We prove everyone wrong when we take up space. And I, and I stand on that. So I think this may be the question of the night, quite frankly, you know, why should you stay? And um, it, the one thing I wanna say is I think we're discovering our edges. You know, for a long time, Boston, Boston was about boundaries. People lived in their geography and stayed in their lane. And, and, you know, it's always been the edges that have been the most exciting place. And if you think about great cities, you know, one of my favorite places in D.C. is 7th and F, you know, because it's Chinatown, because it's where the portrait gallery is, because it's where there's some hip, cool, different, funky foods, you know, but it's an edge, you know, it doesn't belong to anybody. And I think we're finally discovering that our edges are the best places in Boston, whether it's, you know, Melnia Cass and, uh, and Washington Street at Toro, or whether we're finding it at, you know, Melnia Cass as we go into Nubian Square. You know, we're, we're finding that the excitement is at the edge and, and it's getting better because of that. So mm, I love that, discovering our edge. Um, that's right. <laughs> Protect your edges. Um, there's a question here around young people. And, you know, I want to, I think, you know, for anyone, but particularly Derek, I know this is um, something that Julia is passionate about um, and anyone else who wants to chime in. Um, but what are some ways that young people, youth can be included in the situation, in the solutions? And this question is from a teacher. She said, I'm a teacher here. I'd love to share some ideas with my students. Uh, I think, um young people need to be given more of an incentive to get into healthier, more productive habits. Because what I've, what I've noticed um, is, you know, with the social media era, young people aren't as active, aren't as involved, aren't as included as they should be. That was like a drop the mic comment. Did he just, y'all, what happened? He, I, I think he, um, I think he dropped off. Julia, you can go ahead and yeah, so you everybody knows who's uh, and if anyone's following me, I see Jacob's getting lots of love on the chat. You're a celebrity, Jacob. I'm not bringing you anywhere again. Um, that's just teasing. It, so really quick in terms of just young people, for those who, who are following me, know that that is my number one passion. And so a lot of the things that we've been doing in our office is actually building their capacity so that they can lead. Um, we created a civic engagement institute. They are writing policy alongside us. They're hosting their own town halls. And in terms of um, doing this work uh, from our campaign side of things, we're gonna be hosting a youth engagement um, event, which I'll be reaching out to some of y'all for. And we're gonna create a platform for young entrepreneurs to showcase their work. Um, to showcase their talents and, and, and with the hope of creating the type of environment where people can actually um, get inspired and, and reach out to these young people and invest in their vision directly, right? I think that oftentimes we, we rely on the middleman to 
play the like, I'm gonna do you a favor, but if we can just really get out the way and let people kind of like be their own um, bosses, if you will, I think that that's the best way to um, create space for young people to step into their own power is by building their capacity and then literally step into the side and allowing them to lead because that's what the, what the real work is supposed to be about. So we're going to have um, young entrepreneurs um, who are who have lip gloss, you know, young entrepreneurs who have clothing lines. And you know, Kat said it earlier. It's like every day they they recycle our um, culture and then they sell it to us. And what we're trying to do is teach young people entrepreneurship skills early on. Um, and then the last thing is we also are going to be partnering up with um, Madison Park High. Everybody knows it's low tech. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's under-resourced and underutilized. And so what we're doing is going to be working with them in their media and arts, because that's where my background is, and figuring out how we can develop a pipeline. And that's what we do. We create space and opportunities for and build capacity. And, and particularly on this idea of creating places, uh, five years ago, we stood up a program for high school students nationally to introduce them to real estate so they could understand how to make the place. And this year, uh, that program called Rex, which applications are open for now, so you need to go on rex.org, uh, is running in nine institutions, including Howard, Harvard, MIT, Cornell, University of Miami, Marquette, Roosevelt, and Chicago. And we'll have 250 black and brown kids uh, learning how to be the next me, so I don't have to be me again. And uh, we're excited. We're going to try, we're on a campaign to keep adding to that every year and growing the next gen. Thank you. I love that. Uh, we're okay. nearing, oh, go ahead, Jacob, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll make it real quick. Uh, one thing I just wanted to talk about is like, you know, we're talking about creating space for young people. It should be in every different kind of industry. So it should be in business and development and in government too. So in our office, like Julia said, we had a civic engagement institute and two young people actually wrote uh, two pieces of policy for our office. Uh, and it's to our knowledge, the first time that young people have ever under the age of 18 has ever filed anything in the city council. Uh, and we also fought for a youth position on the civ uh, civilian review board. Um, it's someone between the ages of 18 and 21 and it's a paid position because we can't just bring young people into these spaces and expect them to do the work for free. We actually need to be paying them for their time. And so we fought for that and that is now a, a law in the city of Boston. Yeah. Oh, and we also filed a home rule petition with young people to lower the voting age to 16. And that was led by young people, too. So that is what we need to do is step to the side and let them lead, literally. Yeah, love it. Thank you all for that. Um, so we're, we're nearing the end. This has been an amazing, uh, electrifying, educational um, conversation. I was going to keep going, but I decided to stop myself. Conversation. And so um, I want to ask you all uh, each a closing question. Um, and I also wanna say for folks who are listening and watching, um, I know there was some additional questions in the chat um, where I can, I'll try to wrap it into my closing question. Um, also just stay for a couple of minutes at the end, we have a couple of announcements so you all can just hear what's coming next. Um, and you know, thank you for, for um, being with us through this time. So I'll start with um, Catherine. You know, as an organization, as a movement, uh, what plans does Bands Fest have for the rest of 2021 and beyond? Yeah, so Bands Fest, um, we're, we are changing who we are um, and how we define how we're going to show up differently for our communities, for the artists, for their fans, for, the, for their families. Um, and so um, we are starting a, a conversational style series called Artdacity, looking at the intersection of arts um, and civic engagement because a lot of black artists and their fans um, don't always talk about the ways in which they can do more than just be on their platform or experiencing the arts. Um, and so really looking at uh, what are the ways that they can be, uh, that both artists and fans can be more action oriented uh, around policy, around things in their neighborhood, about demanding the things that are necessary for them to actually have access to arts and culture. Um, we're also working on something called uh, BAM University, uh, which is training up the current and future generations of Black artists and Black creative entrepreneurs uh, to develop their the creative side, the creative uh, the business of their creative side, so they can be sustainable but also their personal development. Um, because as we all have experienced is that we're losing mm -hmm. 
even some of our bigger name artists uh, due to drug abuse, health complications, things of that nature. So you can only imagine what can happen at a community level um, when we don't prepare uh, our current um, and future generations of artists on how to take care of themselves so they can create the best things that we get to consume uh, as just a natural benefit. Um, and then the other thing is just growing our festival. Um, it is a 10 year initiative with the city mm -hmm. to scale inside Franklin Park to get to a multi-weekend, multi-stage uh, event that is the festival for the city that celebrates and continues to amplify mm -hmm. Black artists, Black talent, and highlights all of our communities. Um, but that takes work, it takes support, it takes advocacy, it takes communities like this to, to make noise about why green spaces, why outdoor spaces matters for Black and Brown communities. Um, and last but not least, just continuing to show up in spaces um, and, and holding people accountable. You know, that's, that's also what we're doing. So advocacy is a new lane that we're in just to inform all of our artists about that beyond their platform, they need to speak up or else they'll never have a space to be in. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Derek, is Shea Vu ready to reopen and how can the community and local government support Shea Vu and help you all thrive? Uh, we can't hear you. Hold on. No. All right, you might have to drop. All right, you might have to drop it in the chat too. You may have to drop it in the chat. I'll um I'll pull in um Jacob. Um Jacob, what can we do to get involved in supporting legislative policy changes that remove barriers for Black people to access and own spaces? Yeah, it's a great question, and the answer I would say is um email me. Email us at our office if you have an idea, no matter how big or small. Uh, we want to work with you. So that's if you're looking to get your foot in the door, I would say you know we're the people to do that. And then really quick, I just want to say um, my mom, my boyfriend, and two of my eighth grade teachers are in the uh, in the audience tonight. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them and say tell them that I love them. <laughs> this is this is like turning into the Source Awards. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jacob. Um, Julia, along with that, what's what's one tangible, concrete action step that you would give us to support the start and sustainability of Black-owned spaces? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is such a great start in terms of having this conversation here, but we can't have an, a conversation about the conversation and then just leave. I think that it's important for us to always identify measurable action items, right? So I think what I always encourage people to do is like, let's talk about three action steps and things that we're gonna to commit to so we can continue to build. Um, and I think in our office, we're committed to the work. Um, and uh, Gina, as you mentioned, I don't have any shout outs. I'm not on the Source Awards here. My mom doesn't speak English, so she ain't up in here watching anything. And my daughter's 11. But um, but I will say is that if, if, if we've learned anything about our office and the way we roll is people led, right? So when Jacob talks about inviting you in, if you have a policy, and we don't just move work through policies. We also look at this work through programs, protocols, and procedures. There are certain things that we can change in city government that has nothing to do with going through the formal pol um, law changing. Like there's some things that we can shift just by providing some feedback, um, especially around like, how do we get a license and a permit? Like some of these things could be changed by law and some of it could just go for me going upstairs and say, look, here's a recommendation. Here's three things that you could do differently. Um, and maybe be nice to people while you're at it. You know, like it's as simple as that. So I think we don't want to complicate things any more than what they have to, but at the very least, know that you have a partner in us, in our office, um, and we're accessible and we're here for all of it. So thank you. Wonderful. Um, Derek, are you there? No, I think your sound is still off. Okay. Um, Kirk, tell us, what can we expect to see next from Dorchester Bay City Project? How can people follow it? Um, yeah, where can we continue to get information about that and, and other projects you're working on? Yeah, great. Uh, well, 
So you can follow us on uh, Dorchester Bay City. If you just go plug that in, there's an info site, gives you the latest up-to-date information. Um, but what we'll be doing is using the next year and a half before we ever put a shovel in the ground to partner to engage the community. And um, you know that involves the CBOs, the CDCs, you know, the community development corporations, our partners at the Boston Foundation around jobs and employment, uh, and then the business equity initiative around businesses and business capitalization. And then to work with the UMass Boston and the educational institutions to create 22nd century jobs for black and brown people so we can be part of the future, not train for the past. So, uh, you know, we've got a great ramp, we call it, where we match up uh, the time we have with the needs that we have and try to fill that and get people in position to take advantage of what we can make happen at a great place in our city. So looking forward to you all being part of that. Thank you. I'm going to put my Shea Vu hat on for a second and represent. So one thing um, we all can do, Shea Vu does have a, a crowdfunding going on um, to support them and help them to continue to keep their doors open, um, as you all know. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> okay. So uh, once again, I apologize, you guys. Okay. Um, well, uh, at the moment, we're not open for skating because we have to do some uh, some renovations to get the place together safely. Um, being closed over a year has been really tough to really kind of get things back in order, especially with this new, you know, all of the new requirements we have to follow with the COVID-19 pandemic still ongoing. Um, we're currently shooting for June. Uh, but in the meantime, we do have the crowdfunding, like you were mentioning, um, for the GoFundMe campaign. Uh, we are still doing our weekend dinners at Shea Vu, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. And we're going to be releasing like you know merchandise and getting our, getting our online store together too, to, uh, for other ways that people can support for the time being. But I'm I'm very excited to open to a new you know a new crew of skaters and families to serve. Um, over the next couple of years, hopefully with the uh, pandemic, we all have a bigger appreciation for what we have, because I feel like, uh, you know, it takes sometimes pandemics and inconveniences for, uh, you know, things to kind of change. So uh, hopefully, you know, within the next two months, we will be open and you can go to our website, shaverrollerrink.com and find out all the updates, everything that we have going on and everything we'll, we'll be planning, hopefully, to um, get you all prepared to get back on some skates. And you did, you all did do an outdoor skating event this summer, correct? Yes, so, yes, uh, yep, yep. Roller yeah, skating, our, our whole Boston Wild Black community is trying to go roller skating. So maybe we can find a way to, to link up and do a um, special event before yeah. the Yeah, yeah, well, you know, that's, we do a lot of those. We did a couple of outdoor events um, over the summertime. And that was one of the ways we kept the, you know, the community going and engaged. And we met a lot of new people who are on skates because a lot of people bought a lot of skates over the pandemic when the rinks were shut down. So a lot of new people have been opened up to the world of skating. We just hope, you know, it translates into actually the actual community part of it where we, they get to appreciate what we offer as a, you know, as our rink. Nice. Thank you all so much for this conversation. It's given me so much life. We want to give you all some, a, lot, a couple of quick announcements on our end from Boston Wild Black. Um, thank you. So one, we want to, so to, to, to Julia's point, we're not just about conversation for conversation. Um, we want to actually put what we've been doing and others have been doing into action. Um, and so we are currently uh, with our members, with others, this like an extension of this group that you see right now, working on a cultural agenda um, because we want to have conversations with our mayoral candidates um, as well as um, city council and then even you know state uh, around how do we actually take a lot of these things and put it, put it into policy, our practice, our programs, um, as uh, Councilor Mejia has mentioned. And so stay tuned for more. Um, for a date for that, around that conversation, around how we really create a strong uh, cultural agenda. Uh, also subscribe to our YouTube channel, just look up Boston Wild Black. Um, you'll get access to this video, past events that we've had, um, sign up for our mailing list at bostonwildblack.com. And you'll also get a brief survey um, at the end of this program. Um, 
And something that um, Derek just said reminded me as well. Um, and then Thaddeus had asked a question around, I didn't get to ask you all, but he asked, what does black joy mean to you all? And it made me think about Juneteenth that's coming up and um, would love to figure out how we really, we know a lot of it just became, got on a lot of people's radars last year. And, um, but uh, we know what it's meant to us for a long time. Um, the Juneteenth picnic in Franklin Park has always been one of my favorite um, events in Boston. Um, but we also, we wanna continue to think about how do we make it a, a day, a weekend of, of joy. And so stay tuned for more around that. If you all have ideas in the survey that I know everyone's gonna fill out. Um, there's a question about, you know, other types of things you'd like to see Boston All Black do. So be thinking about that and other things, like how can we continue to bring more joy to this space? Um, similar to what Kat mentioned, you know, we are, we want to create better experiences for people, but we also want to tie together uh, policy um, and economic and wealth building. We know that for us to truly thrive, all three of those areas, you know, our money, our wealth, our, our employment, our entrepreneurship, our social lives, um, our relationships, and our, you know, civic engagement and both politics, electoral, but just all the other ways we can get engaged as well need to be full and healthy. And we want to um, help folks to connect the dots between those. So um, last slide around just Boston Wild Black swag. So you all, you all probably can barely see, but I have on um, one of our, um, shirts are what's your b-side shirt um it's a question that um we often ask in the boston while black community essentially you know not not who do you show up at not who where do you work or where you go to school but like who are you really what's your b-side for those of us who are old enough to remember records and cds and tapes you know that had a b-side or maybe not cds but tapes and records that have a b-side so we want to um so I'm I'm repping, but we have a lot of other stuff in our swag shop at bossmallblack.com. And you know, aside from being along with being this membership space, it's just a statement. You know, I mean, if you see the looks that people have when I walk into a nice restaurant with a boss mall black mask plastered across my face, um, because it it says something, it says a lot um, without even having to say too much. So please um grab you some swag, um, show up on your Zoom calls with your boss mall black mug um, and, and let folks ask questions about what that means. Um, and stay engaged in these conversations. We'll, we'll have a follow-up um, in a couple of months um, around this cultural agenda that I mentioned. We hope to do some public stuff this summer, hopefully with Shea Vu and others, BAMS Fest, King Boston, Beth Mull, um, Ujima, um, our different partners around the city. Um, and we don't need to show this. <laughs> And we want to just make sure that, um, you know, we find ways to keep you all engaged, um, particularly as we gear up to opening up membership again in the summer um, when we turn one in July. So looking forward to staying connected and have a good night. <laughs>